Good afternoon, uh, those of you in Ethiopia, and good morning for those uh, in the US. Um, today we have uh, a presentation on COVID and heart disease by one of the Ethiopian American Doctors Group uh, uh, early founders. Uh, we call them the early 12, uh, those who really had vision and uh, started our group to come up with uh, the, the, um, the group that is now over 350 um, healthcare professionals living in the US and in Europe. Uh, Dr. Henok is um, a board certified general cardiologist as well as interventional cardiologist. He has also masters in public health. Um, he, uh, his medical school training was in Juma uh, many years ago and he is currently uh, actually an associate professor uh, at Louisiana State University uh, in the Division of Cardiology. The topic he's going to talk about um, started because was uh, put on uh, the plan because of the request that was given to us, uh, given the fact that some of the COVID patients uh, were dying from arrhythmias and some other heart disease. So Dr. Henock is going to share uh, some of um, the literature reviews and also some experiences particularly at his home institution um, uh, from his previous home institution in Louisiana, where you know there has been, uh, it has been an epicenter for, for COVID. So Dr. Henock, so the floor is yours. Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, start your presentation. And we're looking forward to questions at the end of your presentation. So thank you. Good afternoon and uh... Uh, good morning for those guys from the U.S. Uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, my talk is going to be on COVID and heart disease and, uh, you know, some of uh, the issues raised lately on the, um, you know, side effects of some of the drugs, the hydrochloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, what does that mean, in, uh, especially in circumstance in Ethiopia? Uh, so I have some cases, actually, um, uh, some of my colleagues from uh, LSU uh, in Louisiana sent me some of uh, the AKGs, but uh, I have a patient who, who got admitted yesterday. Uh, so um, this is a 68 years old um, white male patient uh, who came in early morning yesterday uh, with history of hypertension and uh, coronary artery disease. He was brought by his family because he was found unresponsive. Uh, he was sick for about a, a week with uh, upper respiratory tract infection, cough, fever. So by the time he came into the emergency room, he was in a respiratory distress, unresponsive. He was intubated in the emergency room, very acidotic with pH of 6.9. And uh, they lost the pulse in the AR. Um, CPR was initiated uh, and uh, he was resuscitated with eight minutes of CPR, um, intubated. And uh, um, fortunately now we have the rapid COVID test, which we get the results within 45 minutes and the COVID test was positive. And uh, some of the labs, uh, lactate level was 15.9 with 22,000 of Dow DBC. Initially, troponin was 1.5 and uh, it peaked uh, significantly to 84, 124. Uh, his BNP was 625. Some signs of shock liver with ST of 1400, LT6, 651 and NR of two. So these patients are very sick and a significant number of patients, uh, even though they present with the respiratory symptoms, but uh, uh, about 78% per, uh, of patients, they have some signs and symptoms of heart disease. Uh, actually, the critically ill, it goes about 20%. So this is a chest X-ray, as you can see, uh, ground, uh, uh, glass uh, like infiltrates on the upper lobe and extensive consolidation bilateral on the lower lobe. This is a cut scan, very impressive. Uh, same thing, uh, very extensive um, consolidation uh, on bilaterally, and uh, there is extensive ground glass uh, appearance uh, infiltrations in the middle and upper lobe. 
And uh, this is his EKG, um, basically sinus stack, right bundle branch block. He has some premature beats, PVCs, and he has settled here uh, ST elevation, questionable ST elevation on V2, V3. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, actually, this EKG was sent to me from uh, LSU in Louisiana, a friend of mine. This is also a patient in the 60s, uh, 65. Uh, same thing, uh, cough fever, respiratory distress, end up intubated, uh, elevated troponin. And this is his EKG. And uh, as you can see, he has diffuse ST elevations on uh, lead 2, lead 3, AVF, uh, here V3, uh, V2. This one looks like pericardite. So this patient, they can present. Uh, even though they present with pneumonia, they can have pericardites, myocardites, sometimes non-ST elevation MI, ST elevation MI. And uh, we have difficulty how, how to manage them, whether to take them to the cat lab, treat them medically. Like the patient TC cannot give him anything. He cannot give him antiplatelitis. He cannot give him anticoagulation. Uh, of course, uh, there are not any data that would help uh, in patients with, uh, you know, um, acute MI, which is type two, uh, not the traditional uh, plaque rupture uh, SES. So coming to, um, you know, the mechanism, the basic mechanism uh, of uh, this COVID, uh, because it involves uh, um, the S uh, angiotensin coronary enzyme two receptors. So as you can see, this is a RAS system, uh, the usual angiotensin, angiotensinogen, the angiotensin through the renin system, and then uh, angiotensin converting enzyme from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and uh, has the receptors. And uh, as you remember, all uh, the armaments we have against hypertension, heart failure, or these are one of the main uh, drug treatments we use, the S inhibitors ARB. But there is also another mechanism from angiotensin 2 uh, converts to angiotensin 1 to 7 through angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And this has a negative um, effect uh, opposite to the um, angiotensin 2. Uh, it causes vasodilation, and, uh, but uh, as you know, angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, inflammation, oxidation, and uh, fibrosis. So looking at this um, <coughs> cell, uh, these are the receptors, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors on the cell. And uh, basically, the virus has increased through those receptors inside the cell. And you know, the cell uh, viral replication starts. And uh, you know, the new drugs they are trying is uh, on this target, some of them. Uh, um, the receptor uh, bind uh, unit here uh, was soluble, which can, uh, uh, which is uh, can attach to the receptor here and prevents from the virus going into the cell. And there are some antibodies they are trying also the same thing that can attach to the receptor so that it can prevent the virus from entry to the cell. The same thing, the third one is they develop a receptor kind of agonist that can attach to the virus so that it prevents entering the cell. <clears throat> so on experimental studies uh, with animal models, both S inhibitors and RVs have been shown to upregulate uh, the S2 uh, receptors. So uh, potential upregulation up up of S2 receptors by S inhibitors, ARB has raised some speculation with the potential increased risk of COVID infection uh, with background treatment of those medications. But there is not so far any human studies that, that shows the upregulation. <clears throat> and uh, you have this uh, receptors expression in uh, most of the organs uh, in the lung, uh, through the alveolar cells, in the heart, counteracting the effect of angiotensin II in the intestinal epithelium, vascular endothelium, and the kidney, uh, providing the mechanism for multi-organ failure. Uh, so COVID-19 is linked with increased morbidity and mortality from uh, cardiovascular disease. So the mechanism, one is direct myocardial injury mediated uh, via the 
S2, and uh, of course, the cytokine storm mediated by subtypes of the T helper cells and hypoxia induced excessive intracellular calcium that can cause uh, myoptosis, uh, apoptosis, and necrosis. And from previous experiences, these respiratory viruses are known to cause myocarditis, uh, uh, the influenza virus, uh, SARS, uh, MERS, H1N1, and now the coronavirus. These are known to be associated with myocarditis, uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, exacerbation of heart failure. And um, one study on SARS, um, uh, or uh, shown that patients they have called hypotension, bradycardia, tachycardia, uh, cardiomegaly, arrhythmia, cardiac arrest. Actually, we see a lot of patients here in the States uh, who show up in the ER with uh, cardiac arrest. And some of them actually they are found dead at home. Um, and uh, MERS is associated with acute myocarditis and uh, acute onset heart failure. So, when you come to the case fatality rate, uh, these are you know um, different in different countries. Uh, the factors that contribute to the different case fatality rate maybe is uh, the treatment approach. Uh, but uh, currently, the case fatality rate for China is about four percent, Italy eight six eight point six percent, Spain five point four percent, and US one point three. So the case fatality rate is basically days over the number of uh, diagnosed patients. So when you see this slide from China, <clears throat> um, patients who has comorbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular, they have at increased risk of uh, uh, mortality. In hypertension patients, uh, about 6%, diabetes, 7.3%. Patients who have cardiovascular disease, whether it's uh, congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease, um, on background, they have increased mortality. Not only that, even patients who never had any history of um, cardiovascular disease, of course, can develop myocarditis and acute heart failure. The other is COPD, cancer, and uh, so if you see these numbers, uh, patients who have uh, this background underlying uh, disease, they do uh, very bad than the people who doesn't have any background uh, uh, underlying disease. So what we are seeing these days is most of the patients, especially the critical ill, who end up in the ICU intubated, uh, most of them, they have abnormal troponin values, uh, elevated troponin, uh, elevated BNP. Now the question is, is the abnormal troponin uh, uh, values due to the traditional um, plaque rupture? acute coronary syndrome or the type two because of uh, supply demand mismatch, uh, which most people they think is the latter because of myocarditis. Uh, but uh, whether it's type one uh, plaque rupture, uh, trigger uh, infection or type two based on supply demand is always possible. Abnormal tropon or BNP results shouldn't be considered evidence for a, an acute MI or heart failure. So we see enzyme elevation and uh, whether this is um, true um, acute MI, uh, in a sense, the traditional uh, plaque rupture, acute coronary syndrome, we don't know. <laughs> uh, so the use of echo echocardiography and coronary angiograph for COVID patients with myocardial injury or elevated natriuretic peptide should be restricted to those patients with whom those procedures would be expected meaningfully to affect outcome. Like the patient I showed you earlier, um, we were consulted on the patient, uh, you know, troponin was 1.5, uh, it increased to 84, 124. Patient is intubated, he is on three pressors with levofed, epi, and uh, vasopressin, uh, and still his uh, systolic blood pressure is in the 80 to 90. So at this point, uh, most of our approach to these patients is uh, conservative management. Even on the conservative management, we don't have a um, uh, lot of options because some of them, uh, you know, the, the 
cannot give them anti uh, anti platelets or anticoagulants because they are kind of bleeders. Um, so there is no clinical data so far on human demonstrating the beneficial or adverse outcome with background use of SARB or as other RAS antagonists. So the current guideline is if patient was on these medicines, don't take them off those medicines or don't start new patients, uh, patients with COVID on, this, uh, on these drugs. And uh, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, they come up with a recommendation in the last couple of weeks that they uh, recommend uh, to continue the RAS antagonists, those patients who are currently prescribed such agents which are beneficial whether for hypertension, heart failure, or ischemic heart disease. And uh, COVID with cardiovascular disease should be, treatment should be in individualized, treatment decision should be made according to each patient's hemodynamic status. Do not add or remove any RAS-related treatments. <laughs> Um, so what do we do with patients with acute myocardial in, uh, infarction? Um, first of all, we have to create a safe and efficient medical environment uh, ensured in parallel with effective perfusion therapy. Uh, as much as we try to help these patients, uh, we should also understand you know, the exposure to other staff um, on some of the patients uh, to begin with uh, the uh, you know, once intubated in the ICU, the outcome is grim. Uh, but patients with ST elevation, basically the first choice, what we are doing here is thrombolysis. If they have ST elevation MI, we give them thrombolysis, but we don't know whether that's going to help them. Uh, just we are assuming this is um, the uh, traditional acute myocardial injury. If you have an ST elevation MI, uh, we start them on conservative treatment with uh, antiplatelets, anticoagulants, uh, anti and uh, the beta blockers and the statins until the COVID test comes back. So if they are negative, then just we continue the traditional way of treating these patients. Uh, and, uh, um, I will come to the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine um, uh, controversy here in the United States. As you know, um, we use uh, millions of course of chloroquine back at home um, for the treatment of malaria. When I was back in Ethiopia, actually, I used to work in Humara, so it didn't bother us whether this causes QT prolongation and uh, um, any arrhythmia. Uh, we, I, we, I haven't seen a uh, lot of patients with this complication, but some, especially with, uh, I have seen some with parenteral uh, injection of chloroquine uh, with some uh, bad outcomes. In any ways, um, the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, blocks the SARS-CoV-2 cell entry. Uh, in vitro and preliminary clinical research have suggested um, uh, combination of hydroxychloroquine with uh, azithromycin proved to be an effective treatment for COVID-19. It's believed to act on the entry and post-entry stages of SARS. And uh, as you remember, uh, the, the, it, it came from a very small study in France, uh, 26 treated patients and 16 unrandomized controls showed that uh, hydroxychloroquine or alone or in combination with azithromycin shortens the time to resolution of viral shedding of COVID. Uh, but as you all of know, this, all of them, the chloroquine, hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, um, all prolong QT interval. Actually on the azithromycin, there is black box warning. Uh, some extra uh, excess days uh, with uh, you know, uh, it's uh, presumed to be uh, arrhythmia related with azithromycin. So, drug induced QT prolongation. So, this, these medicines, we know that they cause QT prolongation. Now, uh, every QT prolongation doesn't mean it causes uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia or what you call it, torsad, uh, polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia. But a small proportion of patients with acute C prolongation uh, can suffer from torsad depoint. 
Uh, so chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can cause QT prolongation, uh, but as you know, several hundred million parts of chloroquine have been used worldwide, making it one of the most widely used drugs in history. So what's with this QT interval? Just uh, uh, on the overview of the EKG, this is the normal EKG. You have two intervals, we call them PR interval and QT interval, the P interval. PR interval starts uh, from the depolarization of the P wave in the atrium until the QRS. Basically, the time it travels from the atrium to the QRS. It's basically the time delay in the AV node. <laughs> So the PR segment is from this junction to this. So the reason we need the PR segment is, uh, one, it helps us as a baseline to compare with our patients have ST uh, depression or ST uh, elevation. Uh, the other segment you can use is the TP segment. Uh, actually, this segment doesn't be affected at all. Most of the time it's so on baseline. So your P wave is the atrial depolarization and then uh, continue with, uh, follows with uh, uh, atrial contraction and the QRS is uh, depolarization of ventricle with contraction of the uh, ventricle and we have the ST segment here in the T wave. So the Q interval, the Q interval is from here from the Q until the end of the T wave. This is the interval we are talking about. Now, when this interval is prolonged, some patients, some patients, they may end up developing what you call it polymorphic uh, tachycardia or uh, torsad, the other name. Um, um, so uh, this is the normal EKG, what you call is the 12 lead normal EKG. Basically, you have P wave, QRS, and T wave. If you have upright P wave or lead two, you have normal sinus region. Basically, that means. Uh, the impulse is originating from the uh, sinus node in the right atrium. This is ST elevation. You can see you have your baseline here, uh, PR segment or the TP segment, and this is the ST elevation. These are the Cove Mountain um, ST elevations we usually see in acute myocardial injury, but sometimes you can see it in acute pericarditis and uh, repolarization uh, abnormality. So as a general rule, when you see EKG, as a general rule, there are uh, poor months assessment whether the QT is um, prolonged or not. So what we do is you see from the R to R interval, usually the QT interval should be half or less than half of the distance between R to R interval. Basically, that's what we use. Uh, but you know, these days the computer by itself gonna give you the QT interval. It's gonna give you the uh, corrected QT interval. Uh, but the problem is um, the QT interval uh, also depend on the heart rate. Uh, so the QTC, QTC means corrected QT. This is corrected for the heart rate because if you have bradycardia the QT interval may be underestimated. If you have tachycardia, the QT interval may be overestimated. So they come up with this formula, we call it the budget formula, corrected QTC. Basically, you measure the QT over the RR interval, you get the corrected QTC. Basically, that's the uh, QT corrected to the heart rate. So these are the numbers. Uh, the QTC is a little bit uh, prolonged normally in female, seem to be due to some hormonal difference, uh, but uh, uh, 440, 450 milliseconds, this is borderline in males, and 440, 460 milliseconds is borderline in females. Above that, it's abnormal. But we uh, think it's clinically relevant when it reaches 500 milliseconds. But the idea is if you have prolonged QTC to begin with, then those drugs that can prolong QTC, we have to avoid or we have to monitor these patients closely. So the chloroquines, hydroxychloroquines, and uh, uh, the azithromycin, and there are several drugs that can cause QT prolongation. If we have already baseline QT prolongation, we have to be careful with those drugs. Um, uh, so, but there are some risk factors for QT prolongation, um, age, uh, 
greater than 65 years old, uh, female gender, bradycardia, and sometimes uh, LV failure. And there is what we call it the congenital long QT syndrome. This, these patients, uh, the congenital long QT syndromes, you know, when they get those drugs, uh, you know, they have high risk of uh, developing torsad or polymorphic uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia. And these patients, we have to correct if they have hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. Actually, uh, that's why, why we usually, on patients who we coded with ventricular tachycardia, anyways, we give them mag sulfates in case if this is torsad polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia. So electrolytes abnormalities is increased risk for QT prolongation and arrhythmia and uh, hepatic dysfunction. Now, these are the drugs uh, that cause uh, long QT syndrome. Uh, so there are antipsychotic drugs, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, and the antibiotics, uh, the fluoroquinolones, macrolides, and uh, the antiarrhythmic drugs, especially the sotolol and the quinidine, actually patients, we admit them to the hospital uh, before we start this medicine because we have to monitor the QT interval for 48 hours, especially with sotolol. That's what we do. Patients who need to be started on sotolol, um, we, we admit them to the hospital to measure the QT interval uh, for 48 hours. Uh, so, why is the torsad or uh, the long QT cause uh, polymorphic VT? So there is what we call it long and short. Um, this is RR long, um, uh, from the RR is long cycle. Here is short cycle. If you see, this is what triggers the polymorphic uh, VT. So it triggers and the reason we call it polymorphic is if you see the form of the QRS complex, they are different. In voltage, in width, so we call it polymorphic. It's not monomorphic. So I'm gonna show you what monomorphic means. This is monomorphic VT, basically. This is what we get usually from ischemia, acute MI, scar in the myocardium. But torsa is polymorphic VT, or sometimes they call it twisting VT, because if you see, um, the QRS complex, they are totally different. So polymorphic VT, QRS morphology and axis goes through cyclical alteration, pre-existing prolonged, these patients, they have underlying QT prolongation and classically triggered by preceding uh, long, uh, short pattern. This is monomorphic. Just I put some slides. Uh, we don't have time to go all over the arrhythmias anyways. This is your normal sinus rhythm. This is ventricular tachycardia, uh, uh, monomorphic. The polymorphic uh, VT uh, usually is unstable. So those patients end up uh, get, uh, we need to shock them and resuscitate them. The VT monomorphic, sometimes these patients, they may be stable. Uh, their blood pressure is okay. They are awake, alert. So in those cases, we can try the medicines like uh, lidocaine, uh, amiodarone or mexilectin, uh, what have you. And this is a ventricular fibrillation. Basically, it, this is disorganized. Basically, there is nothing uh, organized electrical activity. Once you see this patient, these patients are unconscious. They need to be um, resuscitated to CPI because they are not going to have pulse. There is no organized ventricular uh, contraction to give you blood pressure. Premature beats, and uh, this is atrial flutter. Uh, atrial flutter um, is uh, it's a micro entry. The flutter waves are big; you can see them. And the R R to R interval usually is uh, regular. That's what's different from atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation R to R is irregular, and sometimes these are very small fibrillating waves, and sometimes it's flat line, you don't see anything, because these are very small micro re, uh, reentry um, arrhythmia that originates from the atrium. So, uh, discontinue and avoid all other non-critical QT prolonging agents, uh, assess a baseline ECG, renal function, hepatic function, uh, serum potassium, and serum magnesium, and we have to correct hypokalemia, uh, two levels of greater than four milli equivalent and magnesium greater than two. 
and relative contraindications if you have baseline uh, QTC above 500 millisecond, even above 450 millisecond, don't start these patients on these drugs that can prolong QT. And the history of long QT syndrome, there are dozens of different types of congenital long QT syndromes, uh, long, long, uh, long QT syndrome, one, two, three. Uh, so those patients, they are, they are uh, congenital. So place on telemetry prior to start of therapy, monitor and optimize serum potassium, acquire ECG hours after the second dose of hydrochloroquine. Uh, if QTC is increased uh, by 60 milliseconds or greater than 500 milliseconds, you have to start either of the medicine or either azithromycin or hydroxychloroquine. And uh, if the QTC remains above 500, then you know you have to consider either dissing the medication or changing it to another form. I think that's what I have with the time. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, you are welcome. Dr. Enoch, thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, actually a very nice review. Uh, actually, now I can go and take my ACLS exam as well. <laughs> and I know I'll do well with all the arrhythmias. Um, uh, I, I see um, uh, Dr. Dr. Teodros, uh, if you are on uh, online, are there any specific things you want to raise? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Girma and Dr. Henok. Hello, Henok, how are you? Hey, Dr. Tedros, you have been here in this house. Yeah, how are you? Uh, <laughs> good to see you. So, good to see you too. It was a really wonderful lecture. And uh, my question is uh, what is the uh, autopsy result of this? The uh, patients who have got uh, COVID 19 and uh, died of cardiac illness or they might have died of RDS, but what is the, the classic okay. autopsy? Yeah, so, so if you see the biomarker stropin, basically what they have is myocarditis. So on the autopsy, they have myocarditis. Actually, some of the patients uh, who are alive also, uh, their echocardiogram is shown very dilated LV, uh, not very uh, severely reduced LV systolic function. Uh, so basically myocarditis, but um, you know, these respiratory infections, even uh, we know sometimes they can trigger acute uh, coronary syndrome, like uh, non-ST elevation MI, ST elevation MI. The plaque can rupture in the coronaries, so they, 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 can, they can present also with the real acute coronary syndrome. Uh, so if they have baseline coronary artery disease, it can ex uh, exacerbate whether it's heart failure or coronary artery disease. Even if they don't have any history of coronary artery disease, these patients, they can present uh, with myocarditis. The AKG I showed you is, looks like pericarditis. So they can present with perimyocarditis usually. And you know, viruses are known to cause myocarditis. Uh, thank you. So, so there are uh, a couple of questions here, uh, Henok. Um, the first one is about uh, CPR. You know, I think um, there was a, a word of caution um, about doing CPR in these patients. And um, I think, um, so are there some policies at your hospital or at, least at LSU that you know how to deal with in, term, in case of cardiac arrest? And uh, so the, the question was, you know, um, resuscitation and, uh, and the CPR may actually cause uh, more infection on the healthcare professionals, but I'm sure it varies uh, from place to place and from person to person, but what kind of uh, uh, guidelines do you have in place? Yeah, so basically now, any patient who is shown up in the AR uh, is just, you have to consider them like they are having uh, COVID. Uh, so, but uh, in terms of uh, CPR, you know, um, all the AR personnel, uh, they have, uh, of course, protective gear, but uh, on any patient, we haven't changed the um, uh, pro uh, protocol for, um, you know, uh, to do CPR on patients. The only thing is, you know, they have protective gear, and uh, sometimes there are some specific uh, personnel that are assigned only to do the CPRs 
not you know the traditional way you have the beepers going up and everybody coming to the room to do CPR. Very uh, you know um, uh, the personnel who are doing uh, CPR, uh, we limited those uh, people who can go to the room and do the CPR. Uh, but as far as you know, you cannot you cannot deny them to resuscitate uh, in the emergency room. Yeah, there's a question about, you know, MI. Um, do patients respond with a standard manner for, you know, in case of MI, when do the treponins drop after treatment? Is PCI done the same way as you would do? Otherwise, what are the experiences and what are the additional precautions that need to be? Yeah, so what we, what we are doing right now is we don't have any data that antiplatelets or anticoagulants would help these patients. Of course, you know, um, troponin elevation, uh, it could be what you call is the traditional type one, which is the plaque, plaque rupture, uh, obstructing the flow of the blood. We know those patients, they benefit from um, antiplatelets, anticoagulation in PCI. But we don't know whether these patients are what they have. From what I gathered, uh, several patients from LSU, they told me they had ST elevation, they took them to the cath lab, actually the coronary is normal. So basically, because of the myocarditis, they have EKG changes, because of the myocarditis, they have troponin elevation. So we don't have data that um, antiplatelets, anticoagulants would help in these patients. Having said that, the protocol now is if patient comes with ST elevation MI with COVID, we don't take them to the cath lab. We give them thrombolytics, basically. That's what we are doing because produce the exposure uh, to the cath lab crew and the other. Um, but we don't know. And But patients with non-ST elevation MI, what we are doing is we manage them uh, medically like we usually do. Uh, with uh, heparin, antiplatelets, aspirin, started, and we wait until the COVID test, uh, you know, comes back. Fortunately, now we don't have to wait days because we can get it within 45 minutes. The result, and then with the risk stratify them, the patients who needs to go to the cath lab, we take them to the cath lab. But generally now, you know, we are very, very cautious and selective who we take to the cath lab. Heno, can I ask you one question uh, while you're there? Uh, Girma, is it right. okay? Yeah. So, so for COVID-proven patients, mm -hmm. uh, if they go to uh, cardiac arrest, do you mm -hmm. do uh, CPR? Or uh, I thought uh, we don't do that anymore for those who are proven and who've been in the hospital. For those who no, are not... No, we, we, we are doing CPR. Actually, the, the patient uh, I uh, showed you from yesterday, they coded him for eight minutes in the ER. And, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, after a couple of hours, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion with the family because his prognosis was grim. But when they come to the ER, how do you know? Well, yeah, the, some the of the ER, patients, you know, they coded. Uh, so uh, we, we are doing CPR. Our protocol is any patient. So, you know. Yeah, so I think you have answered it, Dr. Henock. And in fact, those protocols vary from place to place. And uh, I think it's really important to remember the lecture that was given by Dr. Putzum about, you know, care plan and discussion with the patient and family ahead of time and, and making sure you know, understanding what also they want to be done if uh, heart, you know, you know, the heart stops and, you know, depends on age and comorbidities and all that. So I think it brings always this issue about, about resuscitation uh, if cardiac arrest happens. And uh, I think different hospitals have different protocols. So, so Dow, do you know what we do here in Wisconsin? Y yes, uh, cautiously we do it, but... Uh, up to now, the outcome hasn't been very good. So uh, they are not doing aggressive CPR. They try to uh, discuss with the family ahead of time, as you said exactly. Uh, it is not black and white, but uh, we uh, are not as aggressive as we used to be. Yeah. It so would be very the next interesting question... to see. It would be very interesting to see if there is a review of uh, those 
uh, uh, cases that we had before, um, if it is in literature or something like that, what was the outcome after CPR? So maybe it will reflect, you know, cardiac arrest from viral myocarditis uh, kind of scenarios, right? So, and I think there is also probably a lot of sudden death um, at home, which probably in the future may have to be reviewed. So the, the other question, uh, Henok, is on, you know, in Ethiopia, there's a lot of uh, rheumatic valvular disease. And, um, you know, what do you think, how do you think that affects the prognosis in this group of patients? Is this even something known? Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so COVID, COVID is bad on patients with heart failure, you know. These patients with um, valvular heart disease, especially uh, in European setting, uh, most of them uh, special mitral stenosis. They have atrial fibrillation, big left atrium. Some of them, they have significant uh, MR, dilated LV. So those patients are at high risk. Those patients are at high risk. And also it, it causes exacerbation of uh, heart failure. So it aggravates what they had already. So um, actually those patients now who, who has elevated uh, troponin, uh, elevated BNP, uh, reduced LV systolic function, actually their, their mortality is very high. It's very high. So um, one additional um, question here is, you know, just can you talk about a little bit about myocarditis, um, uh, viral myocarditis and specifically with COVID-19? If there is anything special about it and also, you know, the treatment, what are the things you do? Uh, how do well, you treat? Um, um, as far as uh, viral myocarditis, you know, um, like, you know, the other uh, viral uh, myocarditis, actually, the one we call it idiopathic uh, my cardiomyopathy with low EF, most people, they think uh, patients had some sort of viral infection uh, from before, you know, those uh, um, weird viruses like Oksaki and so on. Uh, but um, I have seen a couple of articles which, they, you know, they have elevated troponin and myocarditis, they did echocardiogram, they have a severe LV systolic function and uh, they treat them with steroids. And there are some uh, patients who respond to steroids of course, steroids is anti-inflammatory. But now, how do you give them steroids if they have also bad pneumonia? That's the question going to arise. But there are some reports that they give them steroids. So, um, Rahel, uh, I know you are online. And uh, do you have some additional thoughts uh, that uh, you want to, to bring at this point? Hi, everybody. Yes, um, I, about the CPR, I know it does vary from institution to institution, but we have looked at data and it just doesn't really show that CPR um, really changes much of any outcome and there's not really a, a, a true benefit. More of an increased risk of exposure for staff. Um, advanced planning is done for patients, but if for some reason um, we are doing CPR, I just, the only thing I really want to stress is uh, no matter what, um, any personnel that walks in that room, first of all, it should be a minimum, minimum, minimum number of personnel that would walk into that room and they have to don the proper PPE, even if it takes time before they can actually start the process of the CPR. That is, that is very, very important. And that's just one thing I wanted to add. Great. Thank you. And um, David, any additional thoughts from your side? Yes, uh, nothing to add. Rahel has said it very clearly. That was my uh, 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 summary from our side because uh, CPR didn't add a whole lot. Uh, I wanted to see a, a well-written paper about review of all cases, I mean, from uh, countries like Italy or Europe in general. Yeah, so thank you. So, uh, you know, it looks like, uh, as usual, we are really a wonderful you know, summary and presentation of um, the topic by Dr. Hinox. So I really want to thank him. Uh, I also want to thank everybody for, you know, coming and uh, attending this um, uh, lecture. So for today, I think that's all what we have. So with that, thank you again. Have a great thank day. Thank you.